Are we ready for some more game-breaking PowerShell? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Sorry for the delay. Thank you very much for coming. Who was here last year? Ooh, so this is all new game breaks for everybody here. Cool. Virtually. Here with us in spirit. All right, so before we get to all the fun game breakery, a bit of brief introduction. This might be a little bit of a repeat for people that were here yesterday. I'm James with Startonomy. We were one of the first PowerShell consultants. Our consultancy is we opened in 2010. I have been scripting PowerShell now for 16 years, which seems like too long, but doesn't generally feel like it on a day-to-day -day basis. I like making useful to tools and interesting toys in PowerShell. This is more in the useful tools category, but also in the ways that you can kind of rethink your profession. I've treated po programming in PowerShell as a very satisfying game. I mean, some people go back and forth on whether they're dev or ops. Yeah, I got a lot of dev in my heart. And if you're a good developer, you can enjoy the game of figuring out how to do more and more interesting stuff. That's why I keep it PowerShell. Because every day, every week, every month, every year, I'm finding new ways to break the game. I'm also kind of getting a little sick of how it's presented. So what is the game of PowerShell? Officially, from Docs, and if the guy who writes the Docs is in here, you can fix this. The game is PowerShell is a cross-platform task automation and configuration management framework consisting of a command line shell and scripting language. This sounds like a really boring game, right? Like official documentation-wise. Now, I'm guessing that you all probably see it closer to how I do, which is PowerShell's game is Converting raw resources into easy building blocks, building cool things with those blocks, and beating other programming languages at their own game. Uh, putting a bit more pithily, anything they can do, we can do better, right? So let's discuss a few different ways to break the game of PowerShell. PowerShell is a very unique, modular, cross-platform programming language. It is incredibly flexible. By contrast, almost every other programming language you run into is very rigid. This is a key difference we're gonna keep coming back to because PowerShell already breaks the game of programming. Like, how many of you have tried to build something in an older language, come to it in PowerShell, and found that it went from this to that? It's good at it. Now let's learn how to break the game of PowerShell. Let's start off with this, breaking verb, noun, verbosity. We all know in our heart of hearts that PowerShell commands are supposed to have this verb, noun, naming scheme with this great intention that if the world used standard verbs, it would be really easy to find functionality. And you know, for us it is, it really is. But a lot of that functionality ends up spread across a very small number of verbs. Uh, I think there was a slide deck yesterday that says, when in doubt, just invoke dash blah. <laughs> I've honestly started using use dash blah just because I'm sick of invoke dash blah. Yeah. This ends up tilting the way people perceive PowerShell and also the way ex we experience it. So in practice, non-PowerShell users find this really confusing. Like, how many of you have had a conversation with a scripter from any other language? What it, why, do, why can't it just say kill process? And we'll have the calm, patient understanding. Oh, well, stop process is easier and more standardized. It's easier to find. And this is all true, but it's tying a hand behind our back. It limits PowerShell's elegance significantly. I'm not saying you shouldn't use verb nouns. I'm saying you don't have to. It's not a hard limit. So what is legal? 
commands in PowerShell can be almost anything. Those, these following command names are all technically legal. You can have a command that's a URL. Technically legal command. If you define it, that will run. You can have a command that looks like a regular expression capture. You can have simple operator look thing, looking things like dot at. You can have keywords. And this is one we're actually kind of all familiar with because raise your hand if you use pester. Okay, does pester really adhere to verb noun? Is it better for it? Okay. Yeah. So why are we tying our hand behind our back again? So what's not legal? Curly braces and parentheses cannot easily be declared. <laughs> Note, I'm not actually saying they're illegal. They're just really hard to declare and almost as bad to invoke. And punctuation used in operators cannot start a command, at least, again, one that you want to run interactively. By this, I mean, who knows about the function drive? Cool. Yeah, you can create illegal command names in there, get the reference from the function drive, run them, no matter what. But for the most part, this opens up a whole world of functionality that can be grouped very differently from verb noun pairing. So now we're going to introduce how we get to that. Who's heard me mention smart aliasing? Cool. It's cache arises. Smart aliasing is when you, one, create multiple aliases to a single command. Two, use the name of the caller to change functionality. Dollar my invocation, everybody know it? Okay, dollar my invocation, invocation name is the name you are called with. And I can actually use that as a nice little lookup table for, okay, I was called like this, so I should do that. Now, brief caveat, if you're calling with a dot operator or an and, my invocation line will have what you're calling. My invocation name will be dot or and. That's a little frustrating, but it's surmountable. Dynamic parameters can also end up being used for more dynamic functionality. So if I have a smart alias that points to a thing that I look up that has extra parameters for it, I can dynamically declare those parameters and make my smart alias even smarter. This is a really great way to surface a suite of similar functionality without rewriting code. Because basically I can define a sort of naming convention for a smart alias and build a module around that naming convention, and then here is this whole mini DSL built in PowerShell, all connecting back to generally one command. Maybe two if I'm feeling crazy. Let's see it in action. This is where we get to start to talk about the fun tools. Yesterday, I think I went through four modules in 45 minutes. This one, we got a bit of a handicap because we're starting late, so let's see. Module number one. Irregular. Who's heard me talk about irregular? One. I need to hype more. Over the years, I have gotten pretty good at regex. This terrifies me. <laughs> Deeply. Like, every time I actually look at a regex and read it with my eyes, I feel like Something is broken inside of me, and I should kind of be hearing the theme from the omen. <laughs> Complex regex is a huge pain to write, and an equal pain to see. Like, I think my eyes have stopped bleeding. I'm not sure. So a while ago, I set out to solve both of these problems, of getting regex easier for other people, myself, and making it easier to write and reuse. So regular helps me write regex and provide a useful and provides a useful and glowing uh, library for regex. It is extensible and embeddable. Both parts are really valuable. Let's take a really quick tour. I fixed my color scheme from yesterday, so you're welcome. 
All right. So I'm going to go import module regular here. Okay. If I get command module regular, by default it'll show me, you know, just the functions. If I go ahead and provide a command type of alias, it's got a little bit more in it. Some of these are pretty obvious in their use, but let's go ahead and try one quick example here. Well, let's go dir filter star.ps1 pipe to PowerShell require. Okay, so those are all the different requirement statements in all the different files. Use regex lets me pipe in files, match the content of that. Basically, you can think of it as a souped up select string. You could, it's not necessarily given it all the credit it deserves. But I can do stuff like extract the match. I can simply use is as an expression. By the way, this is a wonderful PowerShell formatter here. Nice highlighting for your regexes. Does make them kind of easier to read. Kind of. But I have a lot of them here that I can use for any purpose that I'd like. Uh, so again, kind of going through the list here. See if that grid view is workable. So I've been whittling on this over time. There are a lot of them that are quite handy. Uh, some of these form the basis of something like you get. Some of these are used just ad hoc. Great to be able to extract out data from HTML. Great to be able to pull out exact parts of a JSON document. Really nice to be able to extract out bits of markdown. Nice to be able to extract out OpenSCAD if you do that sort of thing. The PowerShell requires and all these other ones are quite helpful and fast. Um, it's handy. More to the point, if you've done any regex, this format should be kind of familiar to you. If you have not done any regex, question, caret, name of thing, caret, that's a named capture. That means this pattern will return a value, name this thing, which fits, right? So yeah, this is a great little example of smarty aliasing. And if I did not have a bunch of other modules to get through, I'd love to luxuriate. But I do. So we're going to move right on from this. I will point out there are two also broad aliases here. Uh, there are bracket dot for use regex and question uh, carrots for new regex. And to give new regex a quick look-see, let's go ahead and take a look at the source of one of these ones. So let's go into PowerShell here. Some of these happen to have source there. So this is a regex for invoking variables source. I can write really complicated regex with an object pipeline. So write regex alias, or actually technically new regex, and write it regex is an alias to it. But new regex, pipe to new regex, pipe to new regex, pipe to new regex. And I can actually build out my regexes step by step with this, and then just throw them in a folder and have that nice name capture format and have all the other ways to work with it. I uh, should also briefly touch on there are a lot of more parameters for this than select string. There's a lot more you can do out of the box. Also, happy to take issues or PRs. Would actually really, really love somebody else to learn some regex so my eyes can stop bleeding. Either that or eye drops. So, that's irregular. Oh, yeah.
multiple aliases to the same like function. And when it hits that function, the function can tell which of the aliases was used to get to that. Is that Bingo. Okay, that's, okay, that's so, the trick. Okay. To repeat for the group, yes, you're pointing multiple aliases at the same function. And then the function says, hey, I know what alias I was called with. I'm going to do this differently. I guess I should probably also show one other thing. We talked about some uh, capability for dynamic parameters. So if I go into regex here and I go, say, to JSON, you'll see that there are a couple of them that are regex PS ones here. And if I go look at that file, that is a PowerShell script that generates a regex, a fairly complicated one with that, actually. But it takes property name. And so if I had more JSON files where I remember what properties are in them, yeah, I would go use this. But uh, you can basically say, you know, dir, well, let's see, do I have any JSON files in this directory? No, dir recurse vulture.json. All right. So I can use it without specifying a property. It'll go grab all of them. Let's go ahead and say I was interested in the property OS. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just going to kind of redux this with some syntax highlighting just to see. You don't want to write this regex. <laughs> I don't want to write this regex. It scares me that I was able to write this regex. It pisses me off. This regex doesn't always work if you have unbalanced brackets and the like within your JSON, but can't be perfect. So yeah, that's irregular. It's a cool module. It's a really useful tool, and it's a great demonstration of smart aliasing. And now we've got one on our scoreboard for modules demonstrated today. Ready. <coughs> We're just getting started. We already took the quick tour. So moving on to the next fun thing, let's talk about splatting it all together. Or let's see if I can get my focus back on my PowerPoint. There we go. Another big bendable rule in PowerShell is that you need to know what's next in the pipeline. Eh. You do not. Splatting is a PowerShell feature that allows you to pass structured arguments to any given command. Everybody knows it, right? Everybody uses it? Cool. It is commonly used to pass parameters down and around using $PS bound parameters. Really handy, good to know. This works, but you have to strip away useless parameters first. How many people have written the same four or five lines of code to do that function by function, time after time? It's just part of what you do in PowerShell. Once you understand splatting, all well, you got to strip away the things that aren't useful. However, PowerShell commands have a lot of metadata. And you don't actually need to do this. You can filter out what you can splat. This is also quite game breaking. Once you've done this, you can even easily make overridable, loadable, and extensible commands. So we're going to talk about this topic going forward a bunch. But the foundational bit of it was a module called Splatter. Splatter is a small PowerShell module that lets you have all sorts of fun with splatting. Also, it's smart alias happy. Get splat, question at. Turns any input objects into valid arguments for any command or script block. The or script block part is actually especially cool. I don't need it to be a real command yet. I can turn that script block into a command, look at its command metadata, and tell you what the match for that is. Find splat will find possible commands and arguments given an input. So, all right, I, I just got this record and database. What could I do with that record and database? Use splat dot app will run input against one or more commands. And merge splat star at 
will help you combine dictionaries and property bags. Everybody kind of with me so far? So let's take a look. So normally one of my examples here is I'll do ID is PID. Oh, let me import the module first. Okay. So we'll do ID is PID, pipe to get process. We all know that this actually should not work because parameters don't mind. Because that's an annoying basic syntax things. I got a hash table, I got to remember to construct a variable, pass it in the right way before it's happy. Yeah. And if I had extra junk, it would not work. But if I go ahead and say question at command get process, cool. Let's make this a little bit clearer. Strips away the junk. And if you know the joy of aliasing, it does not mind if you pass in one of the aliases. It's smart enough to figure that out too. I should also be able to say, uh, odd demo here. Uh, well, I'm not gonna try that hard. But I should also be able to basically say, here is another parameter to find another command and go ahead and use that. I can also say here, question 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 at, which is fine splat. And it turns out I can run this against all these different commands. This also shows you a little bit of the data that it returns. It's kind of fancy here. It will decorate this. So we're seeing it basically because of this particular form of output, but it is still a hash table. It just attaches on these properties. So not only can you splat it to there, you can also say, hey, what matched? What was percentage fit did I have? What was unmapped? What was pipeline? What was not? Yeah, nifty stuff, right? And I'm not going to run this against all the process commands because, you know, that would create problems. But supposing I did want to just go ahead and say run this. Easy enough. Now, one other thing I alluded to, but we'll actually make more clear at this point is how to dynamically do this against a given script block. I actually make that kind of a useful script there. Not a very useful script, but somewhat of a useful script. Okay, so sit there and absorb. There was not ever really a command for SB1 or SB2. I didn't really know what the structure of the object would be. I can pipe it into use flat against a bunch of anonymous script blocks, and there I go. I think there was one talk on Splatter that I had set up basically. Here was a record of a person, and based off of all right, well, they have age, they have location, they have this. I would be able to write their profile, essentially, in conditionals. And instead of writing that conditional as an if, I can just have a bunch of script blocks. I'm not necessarily saying this is better. It's different, and it's a whole other set of capabilities. It kind of opens the door to extensibility. And this is one that I've been able to crack very broadly open since. So back to the slide deck, two tools down. Sorry to everybody that left early, they are missing fun. <laughs> but that's my fault.
Let's talk about extending functions. Who have I mentioned extensions to here yet? Nobody? Really? Thought I talked about it in the UGIT thing. But now that we've actually supercharged splatting, let's talk extensibility. You can view any script or function as a contract of parameters and functionality. Essentially, the params of a command are an interface. Right? And we kind of, even by the verb noun pairing, generally have a pretty good idea of what it might do. <coughs> if I say stop process, I'm pretty sure it's going to stop it. Any command can be extended with parameters from another command. So if I go and take your command metadata for function x, y, or z, I can tack it on to another function just by building dynamic parameters. This is great, but it doesn't help me understand which commands I should do that to or how to formalize that relationship. Like, splatter proves the point that I can basically just pass the arguments around. How the hell do I organize this logically so that I can consistently define an inner relationship between commands? Well, by effective cheating. Since Microsoft only uses the management automation commandlet attribute for compiled commands, you know, you'll see that on top of any compiled command. You'll see a commandlet attribute, verb, noun. We can use this to describe relationships between functions and scripts. If I run into a function that has a commandlet attribute, and it says it is extending out git, with that commandlet attribute, I can be pretty certain it's something I could call from out git. Not 100% certain. If I want to get 100%, well, I can combine it with a bit of the slotting technology. I can say, go give me your dynamic parameters and extend out git with them if I want. Although in that particular case, I'm not doing it. This was something that I proved out initially uh, for the module I talked about a lot yesterday, which is rough draft because FFmpeg is huge and I did not want to go insane writing mile-long parameters. So, they came up with this thing called piecemeal. Is Justin Grow in the room? Shucks. Well, you can either consider a lot or a throw under the bus. I was looking for a name for this and go on the bridge. Hey, so I'm gonna try to figure out how to extend functions bit by bit, uh, bounce names around a bit. Justin Grote's suggestion was piecemeal. That's the one that's been kept. Piecemeal is a module for building easy and extendable plugins for PowerShell. And it's actually going to be the foundational basis of the next few things we're talking about. So keeping track, we are now on tool number three. Sorry, the text gets a little small on some of them. Piecemeal is a module that helps you add extensibility to any other module. Uh, we're going to come back to this in a bit, but is anybody familiar with Easy Out and then Easy Out's philosophy to, towards being a build tool? This is something that I have in a number of different things. You do not ship piecemeal. You use piecemeal to give you something to ship. Right? I like building tools that will help you at build time but will not be required for your module. It will just embed the portion of themselves they need because it's somewhat easier from a serviceability perspective, and it's a lot easier and better from a bandwidth perspective. If I'm downloading your module and it had to include all of my module just for yay little code, <sighs> sure, I'm helping my download stats, but I'm hurting the world. It is, again, a build tool. You do not ship meal, piecemeal. You ship the functions piecemeal generates. Install piecemeal will produce a copy of get extension for your module. Up until last weekend, actually, piecemeal only had those two commands. I now have new extension, which is actually also somewhat ironically extendable. So you can use piecemeal to just generate the scaffolding of an extension script, say what commands you're attached to, and reuse that in any given module. Get extension can help you get the dynamic parameters for a given command name. So how did edit media get 243 parameters? 
Well, it kind of didn't. I have a dynamic param block that's a little one-liner on top of edit media. It says, go find me all the dynamic parameters for edit media. Beastmail does that. Or more properly, get rough draft extension, the function piecemeal install for rough draft. You can also find the extensions that could run, given a command name and some parameters. Or if you feel really brave, you can just go run them. All right, I have parameters, whatever match, go. You can also get extensions that are valid, given an input to validate. This is another joy of attribute hacking. And I think there's actually an attribute discussion going on at this exact time. If not, there have been a couple this week. But attribute hacking is great. The validation attributes in PowerShell, they only currently apply to the parameters, not the function. But there's no particular reason why you can't apply one to a function. You could put it on there. It can make sense in a given context. In the case of uget, which we're going to come back to in, again in a bit, validate pattern is what's telling me oh, I'm running this git command, so run that extension. Because they're all valid extensions for out git, but only one of them or two of them might make sense for a given git command. So this module is very, very, very useful. It is pretty young. I think it's five months old now, just around Christmas. I have already integrated it into well, four or five other modules. I uh, continue to get pretty rapid mileage out of this, and so will you. If you want to try to build something extensible in PowerShell, please try piecemeal. It is really easy and very responsive as a project. If I have a new feature that I need and anything that's extensible, I tend to add it to here. Also, like Splatter, like Irregular, you can embed it. It's pretty short to embed. I think it's about 500 lines at this point is again already helped build several useful tools. And we're going to take a look at some of them briefly after we take a tiny look at piecemeal. So I'm going to go to Visual Studio Code. Or I'm going to discover that I don't have code open yet today. No, there it is. There's my mouse. Kind of jumping ahead here or behind depending on your perspective. There we go. Okay, so let's go take a look at get, you get extension here, just because I'm in a directory that already uses it. I'm actually going to take the last part of this command out, that output path, just to show you how it works or what it's doing. So I'm installing an extension with the noun you get extension with the alias and file names of git, the module of uget. Oh. Always got to remember to import the thing first. And type it correctly. Piece of meal. So yeah, there's your regenerated function. And if I go look at the way that this works, all right, there's get extension, and here's install piecemeal. And since I kind of can't go that far without highlighting fun tricks, uh, get extension is nice and generic, has all the different parameters that I'd be exporting mostly install piecemeal actually is a really handy generic installer for any given function, almost. I'm able to do a couple of different verbs in this now. I guess I haven't get pulled on this one. Um, but what I can do here is I can actually take the AST of whatever I was going to export, skip any parameters that existed on this function that I provided values to, and embed them inside of the copied function. So that, that is literally what install piecemeal is doing, is saying, basically, go embed, get extension, strip out any parameters you pass to install piecemeal, 
and put them at the top of the begin block. And this is, again, a really great, really generic way to make a per function installer that is customizable. So, cool trick along the way, nice and handy module. And I think my timing is kind of great because the first thing I'm going to try to talk through in terms of things that I've extended, if the slide deck will get back with me here for a second, is you get. Who was there for the lightning round yesterday? All right. Who remembers enough of how that worked? Okay. <laughs> so this has already kind of been spoiled by myself. It's a nice game-breaking module. You get overrides Git by defining it as an alias to use Git, because I'm getting sick of invoke Git or invoke X, Y, or Z. Use Git calls Git as normal, basically, almost. And it'll pipe results to out git. Out git extensions use a validate pattern to indicate which git commands they apply to. Each extension converts output from that git command into objects. OK? And type files make these objects much more useful. Formatting files give that full color experience. And that's where we're about to get to the module you're interested in. So let's take a quick look back at this one here for a second. In particular, let's git log. Oh, look, actual objects. Let me extend this up a little bit. Uh, one other thing I'm particularly proud of is that uh, I've built quite a nice set of formatters here. Uh, here. Worn and yellow, if you're on main or master. Uh, unstaged or untracked files are actually rendered as files in PowerShell, whatever your formatter might be. They are, in fact, untracked files in PowerShell. So let me get status, select object, expand property, untracked. Yeah. It's also not that bad. If I go look at each of the extensions here, dir.extensions, get content. Let's just see how many I've got there. And then measure object word line character. So 800 lines to turn all the core Git scenarios into objects. That's not bad. Not at all. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at git status. And I've also got to keep an eye on time because we are, oh, didn't update the counter. So we got irregular. We got splatter. We got piecemeal. We're on to you get. Right? We're up to four, right? Cool. So let's take a look at git pull. It's pretty, pretty easy one. I'm valid when this happens. I output either no change or a fast forward. Not handling all the mergers yet. I accumulate all the lines that I got. If it was already up to date, I output one type of object. If it was a fast forward, I go through each of the lines. And I pull out pieces of information from each one of them like what source and destination branch, and then if there were lines of pluses and minuses, how many changes were in each file. It's not particularly complicated. 103 lines for git status. So everybody's seeing some of the benefit of extensibility here. Also, everybody's going to go home, download and install new git, and, or you get, and never, ever use get it as normal text again, right? Cool, hopefully. So, that's you get. And that's number four. I'm going to ask a question about that. One of the things, like, at least uh, I've been hit with when you use kind of wrappers around things is like when there's an update and the syntax changes, right? Because if you're 
because you're looking at specific syntax coming from Git, and if that changes, and the version, so like. Yeah, uh, I, I hear that concern. However, and two bits here. Uh, the concern was what happens if Git changes. Bit number one is uh, definitely not the only person's pulling something like this trick. There's actually a whole pagination ecosystem for Git, and they are also doing this. They're not, oh, and if you shake the tree the right way, you can get full objects. Nope. They're also parsing. So Git has kind of backed itself very much into that corner of has to remain the same from a parsability perspective. Do I understand what that full universe of parsability is yet? No. But I can slice it up piecemeal and go after it one by one. Part two. My concern for Git overriding and doing this approach overall initially was localization. It wasn't even that they would change their format. It's okay, well, if, if Git is so universally popular, surely if any command line has been ported into, say, French, you know, a language whose speakers are very famously pro it everywhere, surely Git would have been localized. Nope. Technically, the support for Git localization exists in practice. No matter where you use Git around the world, it is still in English. So yeah, I would feel more worried if less people were depending on Git remaining exactly the same. I will also point out, formatters can change all the time without the underlying objects changing. So if you have something you hate in Git, rendering-wise, get me to parse it, then file issues to actually get good formatting around it. Make sense? Cool. All right. So, four down. Keeping track. Back over to here for number five. At least if it'll start moving the slide deck again. We already did take a quick tour, so moving on to how it works, part two. Easy out. Easy out is actually the oldest module. I am not joking. Easy out was written originally as a test package for the packages feature inside of PowerShell 2. Uh, and it's something that I was able to take outside of Microsoft and open source it very early. And has been the way to write formattings and types if you're in the know since then. It allows you to write types and formats with very simple scripts. You're normally writing format view or writing type view, uh, or you're defining little stub files that contain your types and formatting. Piecemeal recently helped give it a whole new bag of tricks. About two years ago, I added colorization to Easy Out. This is cool. Like I can write a full color formatter. They can be beautiful. That's the good news. Bad news is the way that that worked, worked uh, was with part scripts which is basically a subdirectory of name scripts inside of a module. And if you are in the know, you can type dot set output style inside of your given you know, formatting command, and it would magically pack that set output style up and give you colorization. And there were a few places that Easy Out had made that easier by providing parameters that would call down to that little part to set output style, but figuring out how much rich format you could do within Easy Out was really hard because Easy Out hadn't really kind of figured out a good way to formalize, hey, I'm not just here to help you output stuff, but I'm also an embeddable bit of formatting that you can put into any module. Again, supported colorization for a couple years, did it with hard to discover scripts. Now it has extensible formatting. Any extension to format object will be considered embeddable. Format object is just one big extension bag of a function that just says, find me my extensions. I've got an input object. If there wasn't an extension, pass the input object right through. If there was an extension, 
call it. And that gives me a way to expose any formatting I want with one easy to use command to the user, but also to have a signal to embed that formatting. So let's take a look at how some of that works. First thing I'm actually going to show off is that form easy out currently rewrites formatters a little bit. So I can get a tree view. I can also colorize XML. These are built into the box and fun. But I can also now say format rich text. I can actually find myself uh, wondering if I've updated easy out on this box. Probably not. Yep. Take care of that real quick. Well, maybe. Yeah. So format object, input object high. And foreground color, red. And invert. And format object, in this case, is pointing back to format rich text. And if I write format view expression, Okay, so I'm going to input object hi, foreground color red, and invert. Okay, so I can basically have an easy enough to embed form of that. Let me finish this off by putting that into a full action here. Write format view type name foo action. This, cool. And so far, format rich text hasn't changed. I'm not doing anything extra special. Still have just a standard one. But when I go to out format data to combine this into the one full PS1 XML, I'm going to go ahead and give it a module name of blah. I get a little bit more. What happens? Well, for one, I get all of format text embedded inside of the formatter. It's embedded into its own custom control. It won't clutter your namespaces. It won't show up as format rich text, and you won't have various formats rich text fighting with each other. And then you got this bootstrapper basically to go load up that. And then the reference inside of there has been rewritten. Yeah, Visual Studio Code and mouse pads are not my friend. There. So now I'm calling a script block that has the variant of format rich text built at that point in time by easy out for this module. That means every single one of you in this room could build different modules with different copies of easy out, slightly different versions of format rich text, and nobody would step on each other's toes. And this in turn means that I can do really advanced formatting now. Another quick example of what I can do out of the box in this at this point is format YAML. This is faster than convert to YAML, by the way, also requires less DLLs. Also, again, you can all have a different copy of it shipped in. And it's still a PowerShell object because it's a formatter. So you have a normal PowerShell object. In case you don't know, the formatting engine will render it however you'd like. OK, we got oh, 30 minutes left. Yeah. OK. 
So, irregular, splatter, piecemeal, you get, easy out, up to five. Back at it. Another one I talked about yesterday that is an example of this extensibility mechanism is Rough Draft. It's a module for multimedia built atop of FM, FFmpeg. FFmpeg is a ludicrously powerful multimedia toolkit, and it is obviously horribly arcane and could really benefit from tap completion. Rough Draft organizes multimedia scenarios into several extensible dash media commands. This lets us fill out the functionality of FFmpeg without too much trouble. So let's take a quick look at the module and some of the extensions in it. I'm not going to put up any fun cams today or anything like that. I will actually show you how simple these extensions are. So I'm going to go open up an extension to edit media. Uh, blur is a bit of a big one. Let's go, yeah, let's, let's try blend frame there. So this will have a lot of parameter contract in it. Okay. So this override or gives me a way to blend successive frames. Okay. And you can see this commandlet attribute up at the top tells me that this would apply to edit or show media. Makes sense, right? Cool. Although technically there's a bug in my regex who can spot it. This would technically apply to starts with edit media or thing containing show. Uh, we have one mandatory parameter that we kind of use as a key and a handshake. Yes, I really want to blend frames. Then we have a validate set describing the blend mode. And we have another validate set because I can actually blend for a given color. We have a blend expression, color expression opacity. And then we construct the arguments. FFmpeg arguments are basically key equals value. And then each set of key value is separated by a colon, and that's before we get into the quoting hell. But basically, I walk through that list, create key equals value, join by colon, and I just return two things from this extension, dash VF and tblend, which is the name of the filter, and it's filter args. Let me take a look at a much simpler one. Let's do no audio. The other way, this is getting a little bit more formal. Remember, I said rough draft was the first of the extensible modules. Well, originally I required this and came to realize that that was kind of a little bit of unnecessary noise. This still can be informative. Uh, an extension can basically say, I I'm inherited data only, which is only take my parameters. I'm inherited, run me and a bunch of other things. And I'm not inherited, run me and nothing else, basically. That's the way I interpret them. You are welcome to do your own thing. But in this case, I have one parameter, no audio, and I just return three simple params that I'm going to pass back to FFmpeg. So if I want to build a new extension, it's really easy. And I don't really have to think about the main command's complexity that often. I just have to think, essentially, in what scenarios is this valid. So cool, useful, seeing where this might be better, or at least a good six of one, half dozen of the other, to here is edit media with a 1,000 commands or parameters to here are 
you know, 60, 80 files with three or four parameters at the top and a few lines beneath them. Extensibility is great. It is incredibly game-changing and breaking, and I cannot understate how much mileage you will get out of it if you try, especially if you're in the name or in the business of building tools. Okay, so irregular splatter, piecemeal, you get easy out, rough draft. Six. I think there's still a few more. Switching away from piecemeal for a bit to another set of functionality. You can script asynchronously. There's a really common thought process that PowerShell has to be top to bottom, which misses out on features there's a whole subsystem for events that most of us have never used. Raise your hand if you knew that there was an eventing subsystem. Raise your hand if you used the eventing subsystem. Okay. New event will broadcast events to the run space. They can also be forwarded to other run spaces. Did anybody else know that? Yeah, that's a really cool one. Uh, I alluded to the NanoLeafs devices yesterday. Those are touch aware. I have to basically be sitting there waiting for UDP packets for that to come in. I obviously can't do that and have stuff going on in my main run space. So I wait for a UDP packet. I generate an event in the background run space. I forward it to my main run space and then I can hook it. These events and their data can act as an efficient multi-channel in-memory log. You have an event, you have a sender, source identifier, message data, and arguments. So you have several different places you could stash data here. And you don't need to worry about handling it at that moment. This is something that I've done more and more. In fact, one of the less sung things that UGIT does is it generates these. Anytime you're running a git command, it's going to generate an event saying, hey, I ran a git command. Okay, it's done. There was its output. And that means that I can write other scripts that sit around git and work with it. They can be handled with register object event or engine event, either or. Actually, register object event will handle in process ones. The register engine event will handle, or uh, object attached ones, register engine event will handle ones with an arbitrary source identifier. You put this together with reg register object event and you can script a whole lot asynchronously. And again, I like building tools and ecosystems, so I said, you know, this is nifty. Now I get it. I'm going to build me a module. Eventful. Easy asynchronous event-driven scripting. It is a module that makes event-driven scripting easier. It adds a few new members to the event commands. You have receive event, alias to receive, which is slightly more flexible than get event and returns them in the right order. Sorry, sorry, very important opinion here, but if you're dealing with eventing, most recent first. Yeah. Send event is a wrapper for new event, but it has pipelining support. This drove me nuts. I can't pipe data to new event. Drives me nuts part two, new event outputs. And this kind of defeats the whole point. I don't actually want my out event to output right to the screen or output to the output channel. I want my event to be a background channel of data. So send event does not output unless I tell it to and allows me to pipe in data. Watch event is the main event though. And this is a crazy function. Watch event is smart or alias to on. But it'll peek ahead at the first parameter. So you can do code like this. On delay in a second or time frame in a second. 
You also get a smart alias per each event source that you find. So like on at file change. So this is handy. Event sources can also exist in any module manifest. Eventful came out last year. It precedes the formalization of extensions with piecemeal. But one of the most satisfying moments of piecemeal's development was I basically, okay, I'm going to go take this extensibility form, go look at Eventful, and go tell me what my extensions are. And because of the way that it's registered, yep, worked right, just perfectly. So there is basically a proto get extension in piecemeal called get event source. And then there's the fun functionality of it. So let's take a real quick tour of it. Back over to here for a second. I am not going to get used to the focus deals. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and get event source. Again, I really do love a good PowerShell formatter, don't you? This is also pulling it all together because I gotta tell you, uh, I did not go to get the help object to get that synopsis. Because, what was the thing yesterday? Ain't nobody got time for that. I'm trying to render really quickly, here were all your event sources. I don't want to wait the third of a second for get help to you know, wake up. But parsing out something's dot synopses, that's real easy. So I'm gonna show a few things here. One is that these are still real PowerShell commands. What do I mean by that? Oh. So this one probably won't have the most useful output, but uh, if I want to, I can say event source zero. Wait. That created a timer and returned back an event in two seconds, basically. Started it up. So an event source will either say, hey, go subscribe to these source identifiers, or it will run a script and return me an event name or a source identifier that you should be waiting for. Thus, not only do I have the whole built-in infrastructure of events, I have a nice way to extend that and make it easier. So let's go ahead and actually see this really run, not look at the event source and say on delay, wait, then in a second, out post. Yeah, it is, it really is. I can also say on my signal. Fire. <laughs> then I can do unleash a volley. Again, send is the alias to send event now. I can pipe stuff into it. And I have this on uh, my signal to fire. I believe it'll be event dot message data. It might be PS event. My memory is a little hazy on these things. Okay. Nope. It was event. So yeah, again, this is. This is handy. 
useful. Uh, and uh, I believe that brings us up to seven, right? So what did you guys all do this morning? I just saw like seven modules demonstrated. We're not done yet. Can I ask a question? Sure. with them like so obviously you can interrogate them uh do they ever get unhealthy or break or like if you built a system that was depending on an event has, like have they solved it enough that you know you bet your life on it or mm. <laughs> maybe uh it depends on what you're using it for I, the big caveat that i'm going to mention is that they're unless you explicitly are sending them from one run space to the other they're currently like in process locked that stated, I mean, you, go, you can all see the path, right? If I took message data, put it into a file, had another run space with a file change handler, taking that message data and recreating that event, I can unblock myself from it. And honestly, Eventful is a really, really cool module that I need to go back to and give some love. One of the scenarios being incredibly persistent handling of events. The other one that I'm interested in is the concept of channels, uh, because just in pure cheekiness, did you know you actually ha can have a command that starts with a hand sign? As long as it's the very first character on the line, you're fine. Um, but yeah, channels would be one case that I'm gonna be moving towards. Another one is going to basically be a better declaration of handlers. Because while this is a great way to be able to subscribe ad hoc, I want to have something that can basically act as, well, these three or four scripts should be run whenever my module starts and should keep running, right? And thus my module can become more event aware. So I'll let you all know when it gets there. So that's eventful. Nifty little guy. Gonna again get a look at get event source here for a second. You can currently do PowerShell asyncs, completion of a job, setting of a variable, that one I'm particularly proud of there, HTTP response, changes in processes, signals on UDP, when a module loads and unloads, time, repetition, file changes and delays. So pretty handy little collection of stuff built in. Let me know if you need more. And that's, I think, all the time we've got for that demo. I think we've got a few more left. Let me actually kind of peek ahead. So one of the other techniques that I've become really fond of over the past few years is uh, rapid RESTful development. Um, how many people have wasted too much of their lives typing the same basically wrapper for invoke rest method over and over again? Writing RESTful commands is already really easy enough, but it is tedious. If you don't already know invoke rest method is your friend, it is, again, very tedious, copy, paste, find, replace, copy, paste, find, replace, fix your API, get it done. We can make this process a lot shorter by combining some tricks. One, bit of regex can be used to pick apart the URL format most commonly found in documentation. It's already in a regular question rest underscore variable. We'll come back to it in a second. But you can take the form you find on MSDN and go get out what variables are embedded in that. That leaves us then with a problem mapping that URL to parameters. The quick and dirty way we can do this is smart aliasing. I can basically say, hey, here is a bunch of smart aliases to a bunch of URLs, and any segment that is replaceable becomes a parameter. Make sense? Cool. The smarter and more flexible way to do this is with parameter sets. And sorry for the typing here, but not my slide deck uh, template. Let's go ahead and see this work in another tool, PS DevOps. Who knows PS DevOps or attended the talk a couple days ago about attribution? I'd mentioned it. 
Okay. Um, PS DevOps is a module for DevOps and PowerShell. It's probably one of my least creative names, which makes me a little sad because it is currently my most starred module on GitHub. But uh, if I go look at some functions in, Azure, or in PS DevOps, let's go look at some Azure DevOps ones first. Uh, sure. Actually, get IDEO builds probably the good one because it is a little overkill. So Azure DevOps has a lot of different endpoints. They don't have an open API, so you had to do a bunch of this by hand, and has a lot of different things that I'd like to expose with a simple command name. There are lots of things related to build that I'd like to be able to return from get IDEO build. I don't want to drive myself insane typing them all, so oh, here's what I do for parameter sets. So if I have build ID there, this will be replaced with the value of build ID. So on and so forth on down. Again, this is kind of proto piecemeal here, uh, but basically I go, tell me my invoke parameters given PS bound parameters. Also, give me some common parameters, because you know, anything in Azure DevOps, I'm either going to need a PAT. If it's on-prem TFS, I'm going to want a credential. There are a couple of other invoke rest method parameters that I'm going to also want to surface. I don't want to type those on every command. So I dynamically add them to every command. And then I go grab all the different parameters, take the parameter set name. There are a couple of cases where I have to kind of fudge the pipelining, but for the most part, it's it's literally just Call it, these are the query parameters that I had to set up, but that's it. These are the ones not directly exposed in the URL. Most of them are just there and done. So 418 lines for get IDEO build. Of that, a whopping 247 are parameter declarations. And I mean, this isn't quite like edit media level of crazy here, but uh, me get oh, import the module <laughs> get command get ADO build how many parameter sets do you currently have friend seventeen parameter sets 17 different ways I can call this commandlet, 400 lines of code. 17 different endpoints surfaced in one thing. Nifty technique. Not quite as crazy though as what I can do if I actually have open API. Another command in PS DevOps is connect GitHub. Doesn't seem like it does that much, right? But now I can get command api.github.com, and I'm just going to select. Actually, I'm going to do the grid view approach there. Of course, I'll have to drag it back over to the monitor. No matter what Git does, as long as they keep this stock up to date, I will be able to generate more and more commands. Well, actually, technically, I'm still only generating the one command. I'm just making a lot of smart aliases to it. But by way of demonstration, I can say api.github.com. Those repositories. Yeah. Okay, so api.github.com, users. Name. Oh yeah, it also handles pagination. I'm thorough. Nifty though, right? Cool. 
Um, okay, we have nine minutes left, I think. This is supposed to go until 10.30, right? Oh. Oh, cool. Well, then I guess we have time for stupid stuff. So that was module number eight. Module number nine, and this is definitely stupid stuff. We've covered a lot of useful tools and techniques already. Let's talk about something a lot more frivolous. Console games. And I do mean that in the dad jokiest, cheekiest way possible. I do not mean an Xbox. <laughs> game development does have a lot of interesting challenges, though. How does the game handle input? How do you manage the game's world? How do you allow things in that world to interact without defining things too rigidly? This is actually a huge problem in game design and creates things that are PowerShell-like in games. In fact, did anyone know the reason why commandlet is spelled like it is? Because the Unreal Engine has had a trademark on C-O-M-M-A-N-D-L-E-T for years. They don't act the same, they don't do exactly the same stuff, but yeah. The Unreal Engine and the use of Lua within the gaming community, both of these are very much driven by the need for games to not be so rigid in their development. So they build engines to make them scriptable. This seems a little bit like the wrong way around to me. Like I figure you should take something really scriptable and make it so it could build games. But honestly, I have a lot of logical problems with professional game developers, and that's part of why I will never do that. That and the pay is crap, unless you have a huge hit and the hours are terrible. Save yourself if you do it. But PowerShell is definitely up to this challenge as well. And, you know, we all had um, a certain amount of time on our hands at a certain point in time. So, Power Arcade. A retro arcade game console in PowerShell. In April 1st, 2020, you know, the time where we had a lot of time on our hands, I released a fun functional joke. Power Arcade. Games are housed within a module that does not need any commands. This game will use some special subdirectories. Games, levels, and sprites or game levels and sprites. The game defines the main logic. Levels define individual levels within the game. Sprites define things that you'd move around. Name of directory.ps1 is used to initialize a game level or sprite. Name of directory.psd1 is used to provide initial data to a game level or sprite. Games and levels can have on underscore key or on key specific key. So I can go write my whole game basically just by having a few specially named files. Other PS1 files become script methods. And before I jump into this, I'm going to kind of flash back to Easy Out for a second, because I didn't really cover tons of the types side of Easy Out. Easy Out makes formatting and types files. This ended up being the inspiration for how Easy Out now handles creation of types files. So if you are like, this is stupid, I don't need to do anything related to creating console games, what did you do with your time in March of 2020? Yeah, you don't need to really worry about that, you can just take the know-how and actually apply it to building types in PowerShell. So you can have a directory where you have a.ps1 become a method, and get underscore foo.ps1 become a script property aliases.txt become a list of aliases, or aliases.ps31 become a list of aliases to given properties. This is how you write types files now. It's really easy, it's also especially nice to discover. I will show you that and you get if we get the time for it. But let's play around a bit with this. Okay. I think in this one I have to go to terminal. 
I actually have a, another game up in the other corner, but I'm going to show you the one that I created as a demo. So start game. Just because I uh, tend to be a little bit cheeky here, I have a Power Arcade directory underneath there, which has ROMs directories. Um, this is actually a variation of the one. Let's go ahead and we'll do with the one that's built in. So I've got a few that I have not published. The one that I published is a great throwback to, all right, who remembers Nibbles? Snake? Okay. My have a, you know, mighty have fallen. Uh, okay, uh, let's go ahead and start with level six. This is not pre recorded video. You might notice the lack of white balancing problems in joke for people from yesterday. Uh, I'm also not trying to beat this game every time I'm in a demo. I keep having to remind myself of that. <laughs> but this is what nobody really, no, nobody spent at least a part of their youth in like school computer labs playing nibbles or gorillas. Anybody else remember gorillas? Yeah, uh, I actually should have picked a more fun level, but now I kind of feel like I have to beat this one now. But, yeah, suicide. Oh, there we go. Game over. Uh, I will say that life got a little bit crazy in a couple ways. One, I don't think this is processed yet, but this is an HD vector update to Nibbles. It's defining the size of the screen. It's trying to make you know, what would have been strong diagonals on a 4-3 aspect ratio work on a widescreen, and, you know, mostly succeeding. I'm going to commit suicide and nibbles a few more times just to show one of the other crazy things because I'm not going to try to beat level 9 in front of everybody. I don't think that's the best use of the remainder of our talk. Um, but because... Oh, do I have bug there? I think I got a bug there. <laughs> Negative seven out of five lives? Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's, let's try this again. Uh, let's go to endless mode here. Because, you know, you can't release an update to a game without, like, you know, changing the resolution to make it HD compatible and adding at least one new feature. And, like, the thing du jour is, like, the old game and add an endless mode, right? So, yeah. Here's an endless mode in Nibbles. It's actually kind of annoyingly hard. <laughs> Both the game itself and it's just really sort of depressing if you end up like having a number pop up or a wall pop up right in front after you've gotten this, which will almost inevitably happen. Yay! But that exact thing that I had described happened to me. And, you know, the level changes up every time, so I can't get used to it. Uh, for the more traditional, though, you know, I also have, say, uh, I guess I have some dead air at the moment. Um, I will also point out that I can find game. This will actually do a search of uh, repositories for things that have tagged Power Arcade. So just really completing the April Fool's Day joke, it is a game platform, console game platform, cross-platform console game engine with a game store, effectively. It was a very thorough April Day Fool's Day joke. I might come back to it to build more fun stuff later. I will go ahead and show off how 
it actually is working for nibbles. Again, we have a game directory. How I handle all the key presses should be kind of obvious there. Levels directory. And we have sprites directory. And the logic is actually very simple. Like, one other thing to note here, I have not done this in Easy Out yet, but this basically denotes collision. So plus when it, sprite A hits B. Uh, plus with commas is when the snake hits a wall, a tail, or another snake. It what? Dies. And if I go ahead and cat, you know. Are you all seeing now how basically the good PowerShell way of thinking about it and taking off our own shackles opens up all sorts of doors? I will also like to politely point out, despite the many caveats of this being an April Fool's Day joke, the only thing that stops this sort of thing from being a real game engine is rendering. And what have I been doing the last year? But slowly and surely chipping away at what PowerShell can render. And actually, I've been doing that for longer than a year, to be real fair. Anyway, so that's Power Arcade. I believe, if I remember my slides correctly, that is the last of the modules, which means we ended up with nine modules. And I really need to throw in one more cool one just to make it an even 10. But let's talk about the next level for a bit. This is where it gets crazy. What is the next rule to break? Uh, if the look on my face doesn't make this clear, I've had a lot of fun since I basically decided to stop caring about necessarily verb noun adherence or what the PowerShell team says needs to be or how PowerShell should be in other people's minds and just stop worrying and love the bomb. PowerShell is a great language. If we could compile it in an extensive way, we could take PowerShell to the next level. A preprocessor could be built atop of regular expressions. Who's done C? I think I just left or lost James O'Neill. So, uh, you two. Two people have done C. Okay? In C if, or C++, if you're sufficiently good at your stuff, you learn to rock preprocessor macros. And you can take, say, whole class implementations and drop them down to a single line. Okay? In fact, uh, if anybody is old enough or aware enough to remember a thing called ATL. Basically, the whole way Windows com used to be written was with a bunch of those macros. So you can do a lot, and you can formalize a lot in a language and an ecosystem if you just have the ability to define a preprocessor macro. We don't. But I do have, if you remember a regular, CFDEF. C define, C include, and that means that I could build a preprocessor for PowerShell. Now, I'm not going to use just that regex because honestly, I can do cooler than C's preprocessor. But if I had a preprocessor in PowerShell, every syntax pedo we have can fly away. Who has been at least somewhat annoyed that they can't say two? Carrot six, two to the sixth power. You got to type math pow two six. Why can't we build a squared operator in PowerShell? Well, only because we think we can't. Like, if you have a preprocessor, you can very definitely take things that would not be legal PowerShell and turn them into legal PowerShell. That's already cool enough. That would open a lot of doors, like per OS compilation, and again, additional operators. Very common thing to run into in compiled code is 
if def windows, do this, else do that. Various modules could benefit from this capability. The other one is that attributes are valid AST even if they don't exist. That just takes some getting. If I, actually I guess it's probably easier to show than tell. If I go ahead and say A, B equals C, there is clearly no A attribute, right? I do need to have a param block for this to be valid. Okay. But it's not complaining now because this is valid AST. Okay. Like I can see various levels of kind of getting it. Remember that all I need to make extensibility work is a good way to handshake? I need to be able to say, hey, I'm an extension for things, and this is my name. If I had defined something like this, I could make this rewrite PowerShell on the fly. A good example that I have actually built out, I think I might even have on this box, is bracket sh. Take a given PowerShell command, wrap it in a shell script. Or bracket cmd. I guess this is starting to kind of get to the real you know, crux of the biscuit. PowerShell as a language is a superset of other languages. Sorry, going ahead of myself. PowerShell as a language is a superset of other languages, and that allows us to theoretically write any and every language in PowerShell. If you are comfortable in PowerShell, there is absolutely no reason I cannot take your parameters and your AST and turn it into Perl, PHP, Ruby, C Sharp. It's just a tedious recursive problem. Go to each of the things that are not a function, go translate them into whatever target language to. And then walk through all the regular tokens. All the comparison operators are easy. .NET classes are a very easy cut point to make. And say, all right, if I'm translating to C Sharp, great. If not, I can tell you I have a translation of this or not. So you can basically use PowerShell as a language for other languages. We already kind of use PowerShell as a meta language, like individually. But we could make it the meta language. There was an old kind of PowerShell toast, the one ring to bind them all. Uh, this is the path, I think, to making PowerShell that one ring. It is entirely possible to write a really cool multi-language transpiler on top of PowerShell. And damn it, if I ever get the time to do it, I will. If you're interested in helping, let me know. They lack the imagination. They apply it elsewhere. And they kind of already have in a different turf. They just don't see it as valuable necessarily in PowerShell. But I mean, you all realize why JavaScript went from just being the browser language to every language, right? Two things. Node.js lets you actually write a local application in, or in JavaScript. And TypeScript which is exactly like what this is. Just less capable than what I'm proposing. But TypeScript basically gives you a compilation chain that transpiles JavaScript into more complicated JavaScript. Like, yay, I can write an interface in TypeScript, and that's the horrible JavaScript it would have generated, and you don't ever have to think about that. And that's the level we can move to as a community. In fact, like, I'm pretty sure every one of the tools mentioned in this talk, you would rather just directly integrate with than actually deeply learn, right? 
that will, <sighs> pop culture references, this is the way. <laughs> Again, because attributes can be chained, this also gives us effectively a compilation object pipeline. So I could say, make this a RESTful endpoint, then go ahead and make a wrapper for that RESTful endpoint, just as one little example. The other case that I love that kind of brought this to, uh, at least my imagination, was explicit output. Only output when I write output, don't output everything. Also, when you're at, while you're at it, turn write output back into an echo, or not an echo, into direct out, so that it doesn't sit waste time. And again, because the AST is a superset of other languages, PowerShell can become any language. Since I got the five minute warning like two minutes ago, I gotta move on to the last one for closer. That's contact and Q&A. Always looking for new ways to make the game. If you've got any fun or interesting ideas or projects, go ahead and reach out. Um, sometimes on Twitter, at James Drew. I did actually tweet last night. I think that's the first time in like four months. Um, I'm on the PowerShell Discord more often, at Start Automating. You can also use some old school email. I hear this works. James.Brundage at start-automating.com. And if you're interested in any of these projects, they are all on GitHub. And most of them are tagged uh, with game-breaking PowerShell. And that's it. Thanks for sticking around.